Chapter 3, Binary Numbers and Putting Pieces Together. In this chapter, we will discover the basics of the binary system, um, how computers operate, um, some history, and why it is important to have an understanding of how all these pieces fit together. It's interesting to note that computers have been around for over 5,000 years or more, some still in use and some lost until recently discovered. The Chinese bead abacus is considered by some as a first computer, um, certainly mechanical in nature, but still a computer nonetheless. Um, it is certainly not a modern digital computer as we know it. Um, in fact, it can be argued that the ev evolution of computers really started with human-powered computers such as the simple bead abacus. Although certainly the Antikythera mechanism <clears throat> lost at sea around 76 BC, um, now housed in Athens, Greece, was an, also an analog computer. Uh, the clock-like device has over 2,000 characters written on it, and experts are still unsure as to its exact use. Um, although navigation and computation of astrological movements is probably its use. Um, the actual word computer, as of 1613, was a term used to describe a human who performs computations or calculations. In one case, to calculate tides for shipping and nautical navigation, certainly a very valuable economic resource. Early computers, which were not lost to the world, such as the ancient Greek device, the Antikythera mechanism, were often special purpose devices and not general purpose machines such as the modern computer. Charles Babbage, a name that you certainly want to be familiar with, his difference engine and analytical engine were designed to compute the very tide calculations um, by hand that, that had been produced by hand by these computers or people. What he'd found is that when he'd gone through the books looking at the tables and done some math on them by hand that they were actually done inaccurately. And so he determined that he could build a machine that would do these computations very accurately as opposed to the people who were not doing them accurately. Uh, another person that you want to look at is Van Ever Bush and his differential analyzer, which helped computate uh, or compute differential equations. It was a very mechanical machine, which used rotating shafts and wheels, very similar to uh, Babbage's machine. It's also of interest to note that many of our computer innovations, such as differential analyzer, ENIAC by Mockley and Eckert, uh, the internet, wearable computers, such as a Zybernaut wearable computer uh, back in the early 90s, and many others were all started as military projects. The ENIAC was an outstanding improvement over current methods to compute shell trajectories from like battleships and long range guns of that type. It's interesting how everyone eventually has reaped the rewards of these niche products or projects. But back to Bush's machine, Van Ever Bush, these were still mechanical machines in nature. The next steps in computer evolution led to computing machines which were more closely aligned to our modern systems. These would include the late 1930s, the ABC computer, a Tanisoft Berry computer, the first electronic digital computer, and later the massive room sized tube based machines such as ENIAC designed by Mockley and Eckert at the University of Pennsylvania, which came from ideas by Atanasoff. To make our current systems possible, the last major step was the development by Shockley, Bardeen, and Bertain of the transistor, or transfer resistor, in 1947. This basically took tubes and shrunk them down to semiconductor status. Bell Labs has patented more inventions than any firm in the world, so it figures that they might be involved in this. The transistor made it possible for the integrated circuit. You may have heard of IC chips. And then finally, multiple IC chips on one chip, the microprocessor, which would replace vacuum tubes for electronic current regulation and switching functions. This certainly lowered heat, lowered energy requirements, and just, you know, basically improved overall uh, ability that computers could run before they'd have a problem. As an interesting note, Grace Hopper, developer of the COBOL programming language and the computer compiler, which translated a programming language into binary language of zeros and ones, um, while working replacing a burned out tube on the ENIAC, she was working on a section of it, there were a lot of different folks working on different sections of ENIAC, which took up multiple rooms, it would only run for about 20 minutes before it burned out a tube. 
she pulled out a circuit board and uh, in actual fact there was not a burned out tube but it was a moth that had shorted out the electronics and that is actually where the term debugging comes from so totally fascinating about uh, Grace Hopper who later became Admiral Grace Hopper all right so <clears throat> there's a little bit of history there about the um, on and off system goes back to uh, ancient India um, so certainly it's been around for a while um, Libanez is a name that you want to be familiar with he's co-inventor of calculus published his thoughts um, about um, binary system in 1701 uh, basically you could go back 3,000 years ago and look at the Chinese I Ching or the classic of changes book of changes um, which is um, several classics on Confucius, Confucianism and the text explains that the universe is a series of contrasting dualities and you could think of you know that zero and one as that contrasting dualities were there other texts? Certainly there are, but those are some that you might want to be familiar with. Back to practical matters. Um, if you understand, computer only knows two states as far as binary machines, not quantum machines that we discussed in a previous chapter. There's an on and off, and a one or a zero. Zero off, one on, or actually any positive integer on. Um, considering the uh, idea of the binary system, uh, you can you break it down to those very simple parts. Morse code really is a series of ones and zeros if you think about it. All right. Now, to break it down into something that makes more sense for humans and in getting into the part where um, machines can do a translation, um, binary ones and zeros, ASCII, A S C I I, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Now, that is a system where we have something that's a little more human readable that can translate to zeros and ones. And so there's an ASCII table that has every representable, representable symbol, number, whatever, by a decimal value, and the decimal value would then be translated to a binary value. All right. So if you'll flip over to the later uh, section of your book there, you'll see an 8-bit binary, a 1 and 8-bit binary. And basically, when you look at that 0, 0, 0, 0, the 7 zeros and 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, all right, they're off bits and on bits. All right, don't think of it as 0 and 1s. Think of it as off and on. 2, you have 6 zeros, a, a, a 1 on, and then a 0 off, all right? And we'll work more with this later in the chapter. But take a second right now and try the bool command with one, zero, and then a, any other valid positive integer like a five, and you'll see it's going to give you a true or a false. Try that out and we'll continue on. Hit pause at this point. Okay, very good. So you try that out, and you can see that the bool command will give you, if you give it a um, zero or a one or any positive integer, it'll give you a true or a false. Bool is a variable type that you want to be familiar with. All right, now, <clears throat> if you'll look at the ASCII table that is represented in the chapter, <clears throat> I mean, you can also look it up online at lookuptables.com or asciitables.com, various different places. Try and write your name in ASCII. For example, if your name was Sam, there is a decimal representation for a capital S. There's a decimal representation for a lowercase a and a decimal representation representation for a lowercase m. Try that out and write that out um, in the space provided. Stop the recording and then try that out. Okay, very good. So, if you look at the machine, <clears throat> you probably heard of something of millions of instructions per second or MIPS when, you record, when you're referring to the speed of a computer. Well, it's how many times that it can sit there and take these, you know, representations and translate them back into ones and zeros, then back into human, you know, representational form. So, pretty impressive when you look at that. <coughs> um, there are other standards besides ASCII. ASCII is the main one you want to be familiar with, but there was one called EBCDIC, E-B-C-D-I-C. There's also Unicode, which is certainly in use. 
Unicode is good because it, represent, it represents international character sets, whereas ASCII does not do a good job of that. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Moving on along. To convert a number to binary, a decimal number to binary, it's really, really, really crazy easy. If you look at the chapter, you'll see that you need to write 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1 across the top of a piece of paper. Think of that as your 8 bits to a byte. All right. Each of those are going to be turned either to on or off. If they are on, then you will take the value up above it and add it to the subsequent value. All right. If they're off, then you will just ignore it. Now, when you are dealing with um, 8 bits to a byte in this representation, you'll need to make sure that you do pad out non-significant characters. The zeros will be non-significant. Otherwise, you'll you know get a count off if you're not careful. When you're using Windows Calculator, as in the text, as it walks you through, it may only give you the significant characters. In the example there, figure 3.2, it'll give you a 101. You would actually need to pad it to the left with the proper number of zeros to get 8 bits. So you'd have zeros padded out in front of that. Now, two other functions in Python that are really handy and they're similar in other languages are your ORD and CHR. ORD will give you the decimal representation in the ASCII table for a single character that you've given it. Note we have single quotes around the character, not double quotes. Double quotes will be for um, strings. CHR is going to take the numeric value that you give it, that's value, and it will give you the actual ASCII symbol back. So whatever the ASCII symbol is for 97, it will give you that, that back. Now, a little peek ahead to other chapters. There's another looping structure that we will we'll work through. It's called a for loop. Um, you can actually try the um, sample code where it says for symbol in range 0 through 255. And then it's going to say print the ASCII number. And then whatever symbol happens to be on each pass through the loop is going to start with 0. It's going to go up to the last value. And it's going to show you every character that you see in the ASCII table. Pretty cool stuff. Try that out. And we'll stop for a second, hit pause. Okay, very good. So this chapter was short, but it certainly has many implications for a programmer. Okay, um, there's a whole lot more that you can do with this, but we're starting, you know, baby steps and trying to get used to this. So look at the terms to know. Try your hands with the activities at the end to reinforce what you've learned. And we will move on to the next chapter soon. Have a nice day.